Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, lunch hour lecture. My name is Professor Neil Strachan. I, I'm, a, I'm the director of the UCL um, Energy Institute. And I'm delighted today to introduce Dr. Rachel Freeman. Rachel is a research fellow in energy transitions at the UCL Energy Institute, um, which is part of the Bartlett School of um, Environment, Energy and Resources. Rachel is currently working on a simulation modeling of the UK's energy transition towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions, and that will be the focus um, um, of, um, of, of her talk. Specifically, Rachel will be discussing how uh, the COVID-19 crisis could be used to improve the energy transition strategy uh, uh, for the coming uh, 30 years and how it would help us change behavior and also uh, change uh, government policy. Uh, we will be taking questions uh, via Slido, and, and the link is in the email that you received, as well as on the screen. So please do uh, uh, join us um, in asking questions and, um, um, and voting up the questions that you think are most interesting, um, and then we'll, we will get to them in the Q&A. Rachel will talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll do the Q&A following that. So um, um, with that introduction, um, I do hope you enjoy the lecture today. And I'll hand over to Rachel to start her presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction, and many thanks to um, to Matt and Sonaro to organising this. Um, so yeah, so we've been going through a quite an interesting time, um, quite traumatic for some people um, with with the COVID nineteen. So uh, I'm not going to talk about the COVID nineteen, but only what we can learn from it um, regarding the UK's energy transition to net zero and like to thank um, Dr. Brunel de Verrier, who who has also helped me to write a blog on this on the subject. Um, so before I start um, any details, I just want to lay out the sort of issues with energy. We, we've got a trilemma. So three things are important at the same time: security, environmental sustainability, and affordability. And all of those have to be balanced. Um, and there's also, uh, we need to consider the supply side of the energy system and the demand side. So we, there, there are various issues, so prim the primary energy production, so like North Sea oil or the imports, um, how we generate electricity and also how we distribute um, and transmit energy of all types, fossil fuels and um, across the grid, uh, the gas grid and the electricity grid. So, um, and on the demand side, we've got you know, millions of pieces of energy using equipment, boilers and cookers and all the rest and large, um, large scale uh, facilities and in industry. And we've also got a little bit of growing on site generation, such as rooftop solar, which is actually kind of a demand side uh, technology because it reduces the amount of demand from the grid. So these are all in play. And um, when we think about energy transition, what we mean is it we want to be able to meet the need for climate change mitigation. Um, and we do that, and, and that, that includes many things, including agriculture and other things. But this talk is only about the energy system, and we want that to be greenhouse gas neutral. So, um, so how do these two challenges compare? Um, so on the left, we've got this uh, more long term challenge of, of getting to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And we are actually including uh, international aviation shipping um, now. And that, that, that started, well, the discussion of it started way back in, as far as back in the 80s. But the, the official target um, uh, sort of committal has been uh, since 2008 with the Climate Change Act. And it goes to 2050. So we've seen growing changes slowly, but you know, surely uh, changes in any production and consumption. Uh, we've seen limited changes in end use technologies, um, a little bit increase in energy costs, but we know more change is going to be coming. So on the right, we have the COVID 19 epidemic. So and this is very fast changing. It started around, for us, it started around February. And we hope it won't be at the most, you know, lasting in a year. We don't really know. Um, so fast, tumultuous disruptions to pretty much all aspects of our lives and new far reaching laws that that's a sort of really interfered with our freedoms to a certain extent. And we've all experienced these changes 
Um, we've had to make adjustments to how we do things, how we how we do business, how we educate, etc. So, so to compare these two, they have different timelines. They have different um, impacts. So, um, yeah, we've we've got a, a even more uh, uh, strong target uh, to reach uh, net zero. We previously it was only eighty percent um, on 1990 levels, and we've seen already a seventy seven. Per- 77% reduction in electricity carbon intensity, um, which is really, really impressive. And But on the demand side, we've seen variable amounts of progress. So this table shows reductions in um, emissions per capita, um, energy per capita, and carbon intensity um, against the 1980 baseline. And we can see that um, emissions per capita have uh, a decrease significantly in domestic and non-domestic sectors for various reasons, but in transport they've gone up a little bit, and uh, similar patterns for how much energy is used and also the carbon intensity of the energy that's used. And if you if you want to link these all, this, these are these are all um, multiplicative. So that means that um, all of these factors are important and they get multiplied together to give you the total um, emissions. And, and so where are we now in terms of moving forward with this? Well, this graph shows the mixture of uh, sectors and fuel types that are still, um, that still need to be addressed. So back in 1980, we had about 600 megatons CO2 per year, and it's now down to around 400, so that's already a third off. Um, and where are we now? So, so going forward, the, the sector and fuel types that are most important are obviously the, in the green sort of brick wall pattern. Trans, transport, petroleum used in transport is by far the biggest uh, category that is, is, is proving very challenging. Next, followed by um, gaseous fuels in non-domestic sectors, so probably a lot of use for industrial processes, um, and domestic gaseous fuels, so that's your home boilers, and um, also electricity. Um, in domestic sectors. Um, and at the same time, you can see that uh, a lot of the electricity um, emissions have gone down significantly, especially since about 2010. Um, and, and partly that is due to the decarbonisation of electricity grid. Um, so well, we talked about the energy system, but we also need to understand transition as a sort of political and social uh, process. You know, uh, the government can set targets, but they can't actually do anything directly, except perhaps in their own estate, but to bring about this transition. But they can govern uh, all of us who do act. Um, and the part of the fuel that enables them to act is, is political capital. So that's sort of like, you know, so it's almost like a permission to act, to, to, to govern. And... Um, in, in terms of where the capital lies in terms of society, um, there's a kind of social capital, it's like an ability to act, plus an imperative to act. So there has to be an ability and also a reason to act. And what we do is we, we've, called, we've combined those two, just call it public willingness to participate. So you can see um, in this diagram that um, you've got actors. Um, so at the top right, you've got actors in governance. So they, they hold the political capital and they can spend that political capital on target setting and also on policies um, to meet those targets. And it creates a kind of policy soup if you add all those up together. And that then actors in society can respond to that in, in various ways. It's not always the way you expect it. And uh, that feeds back as a, a gain or loss in political capital. And that, that kind of happens almost like at a, on an election cycle basis, but sometimes... So sometimes it happens a bit earlier because, for example, if you if you launch a very unpopular pro, uh, program like high fuel taxes, you get um, <laughs> you get fuel protests like like we we have seen um, several times in the past, and then the, the government has to sort of quickly withdraw their policy. Um, so when it comes to this imperative to act that we just talked about. Um, we can see very clearly that, of course, with COVID, there is a very clear, compelling imperative to it. I don't think many people would argue against it. And we, we have, you know, generally allowed that our lives have been 
affected by that response to the virus and across the world. And we can see that under this type of national emergency, political capital is quite high. So they can ask a lot from society to respond to a crisis, sort of a bit, bit like during a war. And, and we can see even uh, today that these far-reaching changes are possible when we've got a clear need. Um, the timeline is limited, so it's, it's like um, yeah, it's a response to a limited event. And also it's clear that our well-being and our health is under threat of harm. So this has kind of opened a, a sort of something called the Overton window, which is a sort of spectrum of acceptability of government policies, um, which means that uh, at the moment we, we would accept more intervention in our daily lives than, than we would normally, but you know, for a reason and for a limited time. So um, is there an imperative to act on energy? So I'm more concentrating here on the demand side rather than supply side, which has a different kind of, um, if you like, dynamic between government um, and the big big energy companies. But on at least um, on on the sort of um, householder and organisational side of things, um, how do we make this imperative to act arise? So it could be through regulations, the taxes, various carrots and sticks, um, or it could be because of, there's an intrinsic desire for individuals to take voluntary actions or other factors which affect our energy use, so a downturn in the economy, for example. So, so we've had a lot of discussion in the public sphere about climate change, about our responses to it, but so far there's not a lot of evidence of these voluntary changes in consumption. Um, and, and government have been unwilling to interfere in our lifestyles and our, the way we run our businesses just to reduce emissions. So. It is not the same as COVID, and it's pretty uncertain about how much public willingness there is to make these changes solely for energy transition, although we do see it sometimes, for example, in line with things like air quality. So interesting enough, so, so uh, some analysis we've done at UCL, so uh, the table presents reductions in energy per capita on 1980, and we can see that um, energy efficiency is achieved quite a lot of reductions. So this is a, um, in um, uh, it's kilos of oil equivalent per person. Um, but the behavioral effect, um, which is probably might be some behavioral changes that save energy, but generally have, have been led to minus savings. So, so um, energy per capita has gone up and especially uh, uh, strongly in air transport. So we see that the net savings and uh, domestic, even though we had a lot of energy efficiency uh, programs running, is, is only a 12% reduction in energy per capita and transport has gone up by 21% in the surface and um, 100, about 120% in air. Um, so if we look at now, we, we want to sort of see what we can learn from, from the last few months if you like, um, in the response to the virus. And, and you know, I think you remember at the beginning of the lockdown, we were like, oh, you can't get what you want when you want it. Um, you have to queue for things. <laughs> so we've had our personal choices restricted um, and a lot of damage to economic stability, a lot of jobs lost um, or threatened, and also being restricted in where you can travel Probably uh, maybe a perception of distance and time changing, maybe a slowing down for, for many people. And of course, that is, is if you're not on the front line fighting the virus, because for them, it must have been, you know, for those people, it's probably the opposite. Uh, maybe a lot of getting to know your neighbours. I know we've been doing that on our street. And um, so the question is, has, has the experience affected attitudes about consumption? Are we, have we learned to live with less? And is that, is that going to stay? And has it made us value the things we do and things we buy differently? Maybe we value things um, less materialistic. Um, um, just referring to a paper from Frank Boone's at all in, um, on changing social practices and uh, transition to sustainable consumption. So they have imagined four futures coming out of the COVID um, crisis so recovery, so we, we come back to pretty much what we were doing before. Collapse, meaning we can't get back to where we were before. We don't really know what that looks like. 
there could be a strong push towards uh, digitalizing as much as possible of, of uh, everyday life. Just, you're seeing a certain amount of, or uh, just uh, decide, deciding to transition to sustainable development as much as possible. Um, but that, of course, depends on individual collective choices and responses to other conditions. And um, so can we bounce back? So it's a bit like thinking like a perturbation to um, a system that's running. So you, you prod it and it sort of wobbles a bit. And if it's stable enough, it will eventually return to what it was doing before. Um, and we have to think about, do we want that? Or or do we want this? Is it is the new normal? Some of it might be pretty awful, but some of it might actually be better. So, but we need to um, think about what conditions in which that a desired new normal would would stick, and um, what skills do we need? So, we might need to think about new skills, resources, insights, uh, how how we do things, and um, and how we can you know move towards a qual qualitatively just and sustainable society, which includes energy transition. And just as an example of changing social practices, this, this graph goes way back to 1952, um, which uh, <laughs> life looked uh, quite different then. But um, in, in that time, we were people traveled approximately about four and a half thousand kilometers per capita a year. And that gradually rose and rose. And you can see the different uh, modes. So buses and coaches have gone down, um, rail sort of went down and then going up again. But um, this is, so this is a stack graph. So the total amount um, reached a high of about 13,000 and now slightly down at um, 12,000. So that is the new shape, uh, normal, that, that amount of travel per person. Um, and of course that all has to be powered with energy, whether it's electricity or whatever energy it is. Um, and you'll see mo um, the majority of it is private travel in private cars. Um, so we want to talk a bit about shifting baselines. So the idea behind shifting baselines is that we don't, it, it comes from the world of ecology, um, but I think it's also, um, yeah, also can be applied to our, our lifestyles. But we notice, we don't notice how much of the natural world has been degraded um, because each generation has a new baseline, that what, a baseline being what's normal. So what we see as pristine nature are, you know, 100 years ago would be seen as degraded. Um, not Probably not everywhere, but in most places. And what we see as degraded, um, future generations will see as natural. Um, so if you were lucky enough not to be on the front line of COVID, then you might have noticed clear air, uh, um, especially in cities, uh, much less noise pollution from traffic and other machinery, no flights going over your head, and the importance of local green spaces. So I would say for most people, there has been a temporary improvement in our local environment. And so we've experienced that. So the question is, will there be a desire to maintain this improved environment? And would we as a society be willing to reduce or change our consumption to achieve that? Um, just as, this is an example um, from Florida, uh, pictures of um, people with their trophies, their fishing trophies. I'm not sure when this is, it probably looks like the 40s or 50s, so they're pretty large fish. And um, the, these photos go forward in time. So they're still pretty large fish at this time. Um, fish are getting smaller as you go on, um, looking like, looks like maybe the 70s there. 80s fish are getting a little smaller and this is the most recent picture which is I think a bit of a sad story in terms of um, of that shifting baseline. Okay uh, so as a energy researcher I'm, I'm looking at this whole thing from a point of view of learning uh, about things we can't usually learn about. So it, there's a lot of new data coming out. Um, during the lockdown we theoretically have enough energy to meet our basic needs of course we are sh a lot of our workplaces are shut down schools are shut down etc so it's not really our full needs but at least uh, in terms of basic survival and uh, the, the concept of sufficiency 
is actually quite important for our pathways planning. We want to know, obviously, you can't go below a certain sufficient level. Um, and so this data from IEA um, provides a sort of high and low balance for energy for, um, for when we think about sufficiency. So, so obviously full lockdown is not how we want to live, but it's interesting that you know, it went for as far as like 33% and partial lockdown, the, the, the reduction in energy use was a little less. And then with limited restrictions, we still had something like um, between five and 15% of, of um, reductions on, on previous. So it's a very neat piece of um, information and of course, none of these are desired outcomes, but they do tell us something interesting. Uh, this is a graph of percentage reduction in electricity demand. And um, you can see that these are in, in almost every country. Um, you've got at least, you know, 20 percent, maybe not Germany, but um, uh, between 10 and 20 percent um, reductions in electricity demand um, during the lockdown. And again, that, that's pretty significant. Um, we've also seen on the oil market some really odd things. Um, so the, 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 the cost of oil went to negative. So you had to pay, pay people to get um, take oil off your hands, uh, which has never happened before, just because of sudden um, uh, lack of uh, demand. And more recently, BP have been warning of a massive uh, hit um, so the pandemic is accelerating the move away from oil. So this is this is, has implications for lots of things, but but definitely for the oil um, oil supply chain and its affordability. Um, so um, Sarkis et al have been looking at this um, supply, sustainable supply and production, and uh, what they've said is that actually. There's many different uh, possibilities out of this um, oil slump. Um, some of them would support sustainability and some might not. So you might have more expensive production. So oil companies might say, well, I'm not going to develop those fields. On the other hand, people might use more because oil is cheaper. Uh, there may be demand. Uh, governments might want to increase taxes because they've got declining revenues. But on the other hand, governments might put climate change on the back burner because of um, recession and job losses and that they take priority. So, so you know, marrying equitable prosperity and climate protection is a Herculean but essential undertaking, as it's a quote from the paper. But then again, it could be seen as too risky um, at, the, uh, at this time. So we don't know. There could be some mixture of all, all of these. It's quite unknown. And finally, I want to talk about the public role of science. Um, so we've seen quite a lot of this, our, uh, our Prime Minister flanked by scientists, and that has actually led to an increase in the public trust in scientists, especially when you've got sort of lots of different versions of, um, of what's happening with the virus. Um, even uh, recently, um, yeah, coronavirus rebuilds Britain's trust in expert opinion. So maybe that in terms of climate, that could actually allow climate scientists to similarly play more of a public role in, in the reasons or, for taking climate action in the future. Um, oh, right. So I, I think I'm going to skip that bit because I'm running out of time a bit. So um, I wanted to talk about the sort of words that we use to describe this. So we've heard this is a war against the virus and it, it's kind of a good analogy because we have a common enemy as this virus. We, we all want to defeat it and the cause and effect are immediate and local and uh, the models that we're using to, um, to, to, to determine the risk uh, of not taking a war against the virus are the fairly, uh, the epidemic models are well known, they've been around a long time they produce a, a single, well, the, the results you, you might have seen sort of exponential curve graphs. Um, fair, relatively simple. And the results the intervention are seen quickly and the desires, of course, get to get life back to normal. So 
what's the how do we compare climate action with um with that well like i have seen people say oh it's like getting on a war footing and we need an apollo mission but i actually don't think that is a good analogy it's not a war because we are sort of our own enemies if you like uh, we are we're sort of responsible so we don't have a common enemy um we get our evidence for the reason for doing something. It comes from very quite complex scientific studies, global models. Um, they're difficult to explain. They're difficult even for um, even for people who work in that field. Um, really complex. Um, the imperative to act again. It comes from the model, so it's not an immediate thing. You don't see someone suffering in front of you. And it doesn't mean that the imperative to act is any less, but it's sort of secondhand, if you like, in terms of how you get your data. And some of the quite far away in future. Um, and we need to make sacrifices now to prevent these projected catastrophe that could happen in the future. And that is a difficult sell, I'm afraid, for some people. Um, we have an uncertainty about the new normal with net zero. Some people fear it will just be a worse version of now, and they don't really fancy it. Um, we have uncertainty about the new normal without mitigation. What do we do? What happens if we do just carry on as normal? Do, do these models, uh, are, can the models be trusted? Are they a good enough reason for us to, to act? Um, so I think it's more like evolution in, in terms of, the, if you think about natural selection and survival of the fittest, which is basically not fittest as in strongest but the continued existence of organisms which are best adapted to their environments so it is a really um a need for for us as, as um human beings to adapt um the way we do things to to our environment and its limitations so um just to conclude um so we've seen really terrible deaths illness hardship uh, stress the, uh, you know, really a lot of harm from this virus. And we don't really know how things are going to um, look maybe in a year or two's time. Are we going to just recover and go back to what we were doing? Are we going to be able to do that for various reasons? Our economy is going to be uh, severely um, hampered? Or can we use it as an accelerate, uh, accelerating transition opportunity? We've seen changes in relationship between government and society, probably we haven't seen since the Second World War, and that might continue, but um, but only with, you know, uh, uh, and there has to be a public acceptance and an understanding of the reason for it. So, so let's so we'll just end on some um, positive, unintended side effects of the, the virus um, response. Um, now, this I don't know if this will happen, but if this is what we can hope for. So uh, wider understanding that a crisis that we, we first see from far from home can impact, you know, um, quite quickly our everyday world. And we, we might be seeing that if climate change is as bad as our models predict, that that might actually become uh, more of a reality. Um, maybe a sensitivity towards our precarious success in modernity. So we're pretty good at making things and shipping around the world and, Etc. But it's not. It, it seems it's a very solid system, but it, it, it isn't as solid as we think. Um, so maybe move more precaution. Um, we've got new data about energy consumption, about what 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 we really what what is kind of sufficiency in that, and also how energy markets um, are behave under unexpected conditions. We we could hope for increased public willingness to participate in the path to net zero. Um, and an increase in political capital, which hopefully will be used in a, a fair and just way um, to achieve equ equitable, beneficial and safe energy transition, um, despite um, increased costs at the, at the start of that transition. Um, so that's my um, presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Rachel, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. That was, that was incredibly interesting. Um, and we have a range of questions coming in on Slido, and I would encourage people to ask their own questions or to um, um, like one of the questions that's already there, and we'll try to go through as many as possible. Um, so um, if we could start, Rachel, 
Um, and I'm going to start with a question called Ron that at least one person has liked. Um, and Ron asks, um, do you think the modern person is so used to the global freedom that we might not be able to reduce air travel demand enough? Yes. Um, I think one of the problems is that we've sort of planned our lives around that. Actually, <laughs> the slide that I didn't show because I was running out of time was actually um, was about was actually about that. Yeah, and unfortunately, the, the OECD um, are predicting almost a quadrupling of air passenger traffic globally um, by 2050, which is a bit shocking. So, yeah, I think I think it's what I would might hope from the COVID. Um, situation is that we might rethink that. I, I think it's going to be a very difficult thing to um, to reduce that sort of as assumption that you can pop off anywhere in the world you like, you know, if you've got enough money and time. Um, yeah, that, that is going to be really hard. I think it's it's almost addictive, that, that, that sort of sense of freedom. But it's not necessarily always a bad thing. Okay, well, we will probably come come back to, to to this key issue um, in different ways, uh, Rachel. So the second question, um, I mean, I mean, half of the half of the question is really on this. So, so the question is, what about people on very low incomes? Mm. Can they make a change? What about people on very high incomes? Will mm. they make a change? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think in some ways, if you look at emissions and you look at uh, you know, you can look at it two ways. You can look at it from a big system viewpoint, which is uh, so the graph I showed you on emissions by sector. And um, that doesn't disaggregate by um, personal carbon footprint. That's a really big picture thing. It shows you where you need to act. But if you can also look at it from bottom up, you can look at it as a personal carbon footprint issue. So in that respect, I think people who are dealing with fuel poverty or struggling with their bills, they are actually uh, the people that we need to ask the least from at this time. Um, the government has a, uh, obviously they have commitments to energy affordability. They, they have measures of fuel poverty. They want to um, make sure that nobody is, is, is struggling to pay their energy bills. So I think really the, the in terms of who needs to change, it would be, anyone with a carbon footprint, uh, you know, from sort of middle and upwards. Um, and we, are, we also know that sometimes people's footprint is low because they just can't afford to spend a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, yeah, carbon footprint and um, uh, income levels are, are very close to the line. Obviously, when you get really rich, <laughs> Then you can't you can't literally be on a plane all day long. There's a kind of limit to how much you consume, but you can have, you know, lots of houses or whatever. So yeah, I think the it really isn't an issue. It shouldn't be an issue for those who are struggling with fuel poverty. It should very much be an issue for those who use their extra income to to consume more. And that they, we I think you have to be careful. You have to measure that on a personal carbon footprint basis. So let's um let's let's continue this theme of questions about about choices and energy consumption. We have a question from someone who has not given their name who asks um, if this is if making decisions about mitigating um, climate change is just different than than lockdown from coronavirus because you can't see in inverted commas the difference that your changes are making to climate. I mean it's it's. It's a global problem, and the impacts are yeah. years. The, the worst impacts are years away. So, yeah. um, how do you get over the fact that you can't see the difference that your changes mm. are making? Mm. Um, I think. Well, it's interesting with the lockdown. People, there's two issues with uh, with environmental damage. The one is the local environment, and the other is, of course, the global environment. So, um, yes, that's right. Greenhouse gas emissions. Um, are generally not visible and, and the impacts are very slow acting. Um, we can see immediate effects from a lack of pollution, which is a local issue and, and very much um, happens. It can happen within days, you know, when she, we, I think most people have noticed that during lockdown, the quality of the air and um, the noise, noise levels going down. So that is one thing you can see immediately, but of course that's not the same as climate which is a global issue. 
Um, but I do think that's one way in, if you like. It's just connecting people with their local environment and, and, and just um, linking up those, those kinds of things directly. So when it comes to global issues, I think the role of scientists is going to be pretty important. Um, and like I said, with the with the, the role of scientists during the during the uh, epidemic, um, I'd like to see. I hope I hope that we you know we as we work in energy transition have learned from the public debates that have been going on when people have been looking at those, those exponential graphs, and that the scientists have been commenting on you know how to interpret those graphs what do they mean how things are measured a really interesting uh, whole process and i'm really you know pleased to see that scientists are really engaging directly with the public on this and there's a, a good deal of interest um in how studies are done and how the how the results are used so i'd like to see this um hopefully carried forward once we're over the the covid crisis um and I know that the, the models are a lot more difficult and the issues are a lot more difficult to understand. But I think we can just keep on um, doing that um, and explaining in whatever way we can. Um, and also uh, bringing, bringing that home um, in terms of the, uh, the economic impacts that we might, we might see from, from climate change in the long term. Um, okay, th uh, thank you, Rachel. So let's um, switch topic now. I'm, I, I'm trying to follow the questions and ask the ones that are being upvoted the most, but I will try to get to them all. So Sarah has asked, do you think a new appreciation for outside space and working remotely may, co may cause mass movement out of large cities and live to more localised living and consumption? Hmm. Uh, I think it's definitely maybe would um, reduce that kind of trend that we've seen with more and more rural areas, um, especially small villages losing uh, population, especially losing population that live there. Um, so you've got lots of local shops and um, local facilities. Uh, yeah, I, I, it will obviously depend on having a really good, reliable broadband system um, that reaches everywhere. And I don't think we, we're there yet. Um, I think um, I think people always want to live in cities. You know, they're more exciting, especially when you're young. You want to be <laughs> you want to be where all the action is. Um, but um, I definitely think it's open. I definitely think it's opened much more opportunity for people to see that it's possible and that there are many benefits. And where you know, as the government says, if you can work from home, uh, that that you know, we could see a regeneration in uh, as long as broadband infrastructure in uh, rural living and, and hopefully more rural um, activities and, and not having to travel, to drive and you know travel to get to work. It would be a very positive thing. Um, great. So, so, so let's keep on firing that you read. Um, um, I want to combine two, one, one from Alina and one from Sally, because they're both talking about wording. So Alina asks, um, uh, about the use of the term climate emergency. It's been used a lot over mm. the last year. If it's useful, should we use other terms? Mm. And, and Sally has asked quite a similar question, and she's actually uh, um, uh, suggesting the words we use for climate change aren't strong enough, um, uh, particularly in relation to the words uh, that we use for the virus. So could you, could you talk about wording and, and how that impacts the um, people's uh, behaviour and the debate? Mm. Um... Yes, I, I do agree. I think the words we use are really important. Um, it, the reason for the emergency, climate emergency phrasing is, of course, that um, we're dealing with a problem which has a long lag time. So even though we're not seeing uh, very strong climate impacts, at least not, not here in the UK, but they might be happening elsewhere in the world, um, the, 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 we know that the, the, the important thing is the cumulative emissions, so which is why it's so so important to start uh, now rather than in 20 years, um, because then the, the rate of emissions reduction would be really catastrophic for economy. So it, it lessens the risk to economy and also lessens the risk of very bad climate change. I don't know uh, personally. I don't know if climate emergency. Is exactly the right phrase. I think it. it, it I, I know what people mean. Why they say it's 
an emergency. Um, I think it probably, to some people, it might seem like you're uh, uh, creating, I don't know, you're over egging it a bit, you know. It, it's very hard, it's a hard thing to communicate. Um, so I don't know, I think it might be worth actually re revisiting that. And the important thing is to make sure that it's understandable and meaningful for everyone in society. It's not, um, it can't just be, you know, certain groups. It's, it's a really a whole society response that we really need, like we have seen with the COVID. So I don't know, I'd like actually, maybe that's a good social science study to find out how different parts of society actually respond to that phrase. Maybe there is a better phrase we can use. <laughs> yeah, make it work for some scientists. <laughs> Um, Rachel, can, can we move to a couple of questions about the role of government? Yes. Um, so we have a question uh, that, 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 that has um, no name attached. But the question is, uh, do you think that people will, will maintain limiting, limiting travel, etc., post lockdown without government legislation imposing restrictions? And I guess the kind of actual is, do you think government uh, still needs to impose um, mm. uh, policies and laws? Mm. Uh, okay, so assuming we get back to you know normal and we've, we've got no restrictions because of the virus, um, I do. I, I, I personally, I think there will be some kind of leftover bits of of what we learned, you know, because maybe that 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 sort of feeling like I have to travel, I have to go here, I have to go there, you know, that kind of rethinking of things, um, and maybe people feel it's less stressful to travel as much. Uh, maybe they found new new ways to do things, or they made friends locally instead of you know keeping in touch with people in faraway places. I don't know. I would like to think so. Um, I know. Um, also, it's quite interesting uh, that if you look at how much people have saved in terms of money, just in terms of their household budget, um, from not doing a lot of the things that they did before. You know, perhaps the the peer pressure to travel. You know. And post on Facebook, look, I've been here or there. Maybe that's going to lessen. And it's it's about different kinds of um, communication. Um, I would, and also, I think a lot, of, a lot of people actually been meeting online. I've, I've made connections with people I haven't seen for years. Um, so, it, you know, with, with the internet, with our digital um, infrastructure, we, we can actually rethink a lot of these things. So hopefully that people have, um, have learned that. I'm not saying that, you know, we won't want to travel or, Etc. But perhaps it's not. Um, it won't be as. Uh, maybe maybe the, those reductions can stay in place. Yeah. I, I, sorry. And about the government. Yeah. Um, I don't think any government so far has ever tried to, you know, directly ask people to not travel as much. Or you know, it really is a very politically. Uh, uh, <laughs> try. You tend to lose votes if you do that. No, I don't know, but I think that would only happen if there were, for example, uh, another strong um, acceptance of the need of, to change and also an, an understanding. I think we do need to understand more how our personal kind of footprints um, um, are relate to the, to the general goal. I think there's a lot of information missing at the moment in terms of carbon accounting. How do we count for things? How much is it? I mean, I'm personally in favour of this carbon, you know, personal carbon footprint uh, trading, you know, which a lot of people have been talking about, which would actually, strangely enough, would be a way to uh, make things fairer. So those 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 who can afford less travel could actually benefit from not travelling by by getting credit for for that. So there's a lot of ways we can do it, and we, you know, we need to make sure it's fair and um, also voluntary, as in people are forced to do things they don't want. So, 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 so to continue um, uh, the, this theme of, of what the government does, Rachel, uh, there is a question about whether political capital as an idea only holds in, in a democratic uh, uh, situation. And if you're in a non-democratic uh, situation, I mean, does the government need, need to care about society? Can't it just do whatever it likes? Mm. Yeah, it's very important. It's a very important concept in, in democratic societies, absolutely. Yes. And and it is very hard to do anything without political capital. That's why governments tend to, when they have a lot of political capital, they do things that are, uh, they know need doing, but they're a bit unpopular. Um, 
So and and the, and if they try to use too much and they don't have that capital, then uh, yeah, they'll get voted out. So I don't know. To be honest, I don't know enough about how how governments make decisions in in non democratic countries. I mean, I imagine that it would be much more authoritarian, and they could just pretty much decide well, we're going to do this and just tell people to do it. I don't know really if that is exactly how things work. Maybe to a certain extent they have just a lot more control. But um, they also have to manage people because society is complex, you know. You can't just tell people to do one thing or another. Um, there, there, there always has to be some kind of a, a public acceptance or a sort of social contract. Um, and when that, you know, when, when that dissolves, then you get great... Um, uncertainty and really disruptive, uh, dangerous change. So you, you want to make sure that uh, you bring people along uh, as much as possible. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd be interested if any, any other researchers from, from other countries with different governance systems um, could, could comment on that. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, Rachel. So I, I, I'm looking at the questions. Um, there are Two responses from from um, um, Alina, really responding to the uh, the issues we've raised before about whether um, um, non cities would be more popular, and, and talking about the language of emergencies versus mm -hmm. not. So I'll, I'll 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 just just let let those stand. Uh, we have one remaining question up there, so if anyone else has a question, please type it now. But I'm just going to read Susie's question because it's quite provocative, and Susie has written. Maybe we're not in an emergency, we're in a Ponzi scheme, living off capital as it was income, about to go bankrupt. So, Rachel, you can answer that in any way you like. Um, yeah, well, I guess when, I mean, when your Ponzi scheme starts to collapse, that's, that is kind of an emergency, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, there is, there is that... There is that uh, view of looking at things i don't think it's entirely a good a good uh, metaphor there, there is a difference between an economic ponzi scheme when it collapses it really collapses and all the money that was used to to build it up is gone right or it's gone to somebody's pocket uh, it's not quite the same because we're getting things like um in natural capital we've got buildings and you know physically uh, human-made capital, um, and th there are stocks of, um, th th there's a kind of regeneration of those stocks uh, that goes on all the time. Sometimes it's too slow, so uh, we use more capital than we are regenerating, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, like you think of the Victorian period, we were building more, much more capital um, than we were using, and we're still benefiting from that. So it's not always clear-cut like that. Um, for sure, our climate models tell us that if we carry on taking natural capital at the rate we are doing, we are going to cause a collapse, um, and that would certainly be an emergency. Um, so we really need to understand the rate of the rates at which we use things versus the rates at which they regenerate. Um, and uh, but you know, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to say anything that's definitely this way or that. All we can say is that there's a risk of something um, if we carry on doing things the way we are. And there's also, uh, there is a way, there, there is a way for us to manage um, if, we, if we can be smart about it. Um, okay, Rachel, we, we, we have one perhaps last question come in, unless other, anyone's uh, uh, doing the next uh, 30 seconds or so. But a really nice last question, uh, which is, um, from someone who's not given the name, but they have written, um, is there lots of energy needed to power all these online interactions? <laughs> Has a rise in emissions sector cancelled out the positive reductions in other areas? Um, rise in emissions due to online uh, online communication? Is that, sorry, well, sorry. I guess online communication. Online shopping. I mean, I mean, I mean, everything to do with with living lives in a different way than we oh. have been before. Well. Okay, all of that runs on electricity. So the, the, the IEA data that um, I showed you shows actually a drop in electricity. And that would include um, all of our online activities. Um, so 
we were fifteen days of lockdown. We were about we still use approximately fifteen percent less than normal. So yeah, it's a, it, you can see a good uh, like a substitution effect where. Um, but now the thing is, we're not getting things we want, right? There's a lot of things we, we're not getting at the moment. We're just sort of putting things on hold. So that's not in, entirely a good comparison. But I think generally the amount of energy to do with this online communication is much smaller than you would use if you um, if you have a material way of getting things, as in you know traveling or uh, buying buying material goods. So yeah, I, I think it's a, it's it's a, the net effect is is actually. Uh, reduction in energy. Well, uh, uh, Rachel, on that on that positive note, then we've come to the end of our questions. So um, I just wanted to firstly thank everyone who's who's joined us today. I hope you find it um, interesting and thought provoking. Rachel, a huge thanks to, uh, to you for presenting um, and, and sharing your ongoing research. I just like to, to to remind everyone that they will be getting uh, an email with a feedback form and also a list of future lunch hour lectures. So please join uh, a future uh, talks in this series. But with that, I will draw the uh, this lunchtime lecture to a close. Um, many and, thanks uh, thank to you, Rachel. for hosting. And, uh, and thank you all and have a very good day.